Well, it's good to be here tonight. Um, you'll turn to Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, as you're turning there, I want to read you um, about these hunters. They shot six deer. Two hunters got a pilot to fly them into the far north for deer hunting. They were quite successful in their venture and bagged six bucks. The pilot came back as arranged to pick them up. They started loading their gear into the plane including the six deer, but the pilot objected and he said, the plane can only take four of your deer. You'll have to leave two of them behind. They argued with him. The year before they had shot six and the pilot had allowed them to put all aboard. The plane was the same model and capacity. Reluctantly, the pilot finally permitted them to put all six aboard. But when they attempted to take off and leave the valley, the little plane could not make it and they crashed into the wilderness. Climbing out of the wreckage, one hunter said to the other, Do you know where we are? I think so, replied the other hunter. I think this is about the same place where we crashed last year. (laughs) Is that greed? I just hope it wasn't the same pilot. Yeah, amen, brother. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter two, verse four is what we're going to be reading, and the title is "Run the Race." Do any of you have a hobby, Jenny? Painting. Painting. Anybody else have a hobby? Don't be bashful. Raise your hand. Tell us. Everybody's got a hobby. A little garden. Garden? Hunting. Hunting. He's one of those guys that crashed into the uh, wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a hobby? Flowers. Flowers. Planting them or? Just having them. Just having them. Okay. Anybody else? My hobby is cutting down trees. Mm. It doesn't cost me. I make money doing it. Mm. I like that. <clears throat> I, I really do. I, I, I actually enjoy it. But you ever notice that when you have a hobby, your interest in that hobby is great enough that you 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 get magazines on it, right? Vicky, do is there a lot of hunting magazines in your house? Not yet. <laughs> They're on order. <laughs> but you do. You you get you get all kinds of information. You go on the internet, you search up stuff, you you print off articles. Are y'all following me? Yeah. When when something interests you, you spend a lot of time thinking about it, talking about it, reading about it, looking at it on T V, looking at it on the internet, on your phone, whatever, right? Right. That's just how we are. Uh, you get books on the subject and so on. Um, <clears throat> have you ever had a hobby, any of you, that no longer interests you? Mm-hmm. Brother John shaking his head back there. Uh, what is it? Drinking. Drinking? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Amen. That's good. Um <clears throat> I I used to uh, I used to run track when I was younger, and of course back then there was no internet, and reading has never been my hobby. I don't really care to read much. It's, it's, as, it's as though I don't have time for it. But really, you make time for what you want to do. Um. <clears throat> But I, it was interesting to me, and I talked to other people about it. I learned from them, got information, helpful information. But when we have a hobby, when we have something that interests us, 
we, we, we do. We, we get all kinds of information about it. It's, it's like um, it's part of our world. It is our world yes, sometimes. <clears throat> then when we no longer have that hobby anymore for whatever reason, then we don't read those books anymore. Mm. We don't read the magazines anymore. They collect dust. Mm. <clears throat> and remember, we're talking about running a race. And if you're not running the race, if you're not running track or something like that, you're probably not reading the books on it anymore. We focus on what's important to us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. And Lord, You've given us Your Word freely. Father, we many times take it for granted. I pray that You'd help us to recognize the real value that we have in our hands when we hold Your Word. And Lord, I pray that You would help us tonight to see what You have for us. And Lord, that's different for each person in here. And I pray that You would show us what that is. Yes. And then, Lord, I ask that You would help us to take action to do what You're telling us to do. Lord, please help me to say what I should and to refrain from saying what I shouldn't so that Your message is delivered. And I thank You for that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In verse 3, just before this one, the Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Here, we're called soldiers. That's what we are. And it's not because we're playing. It's because we're battling. We're at war. Not against each other. In fact, we're not even at war against the unsaved. Mm. Right. I'm going to go a step further. We're not even at war against those drivers on the road. (laughs) We call them idiotic drivers. Hopefully, we don't call them anything worse than that. But we're not at war against those people. We're not at war against our aggravating neighbor. We're not at war against that hard-to-deal-with family member, whoever that may be. We're not at war against them. We're at war against Satan. And this battle is an everyday thing. We may not recognize it, but it is. Many times we don't recognize it until it has hit us between the eyes like a brick wall, and then we're, we still don't recognize it. Now we're at war against that person that Satan has used to create a little bit of an issue. But we're called soldiers. Soldiers for Jesus. How many of you have heard the name Paul Rudd? What what movie did he play in? Ant-Man. I'm going to read this article about Paul Rudd. This is important because we're talking about running the race and we're talking about being a soldier for Jesus. Paul Rudd, when he was first approached to to star in the movie Ant-Man was not in good physical shape for it. And I'm sure they told him what they intended to pay him, not to mention the uh, being being in all of the movie theaters across the world, his face, his body, in the Ant-Man costume 
And because of that recognition, I'm sure, and because of the money, he decided, i got to get in good physical shape here. So this is the article. First, Rudd changed his eating habits by taking the Chris Pratt approach. And I don't know who Chris Pratt is. But he took the Chris Pratt approach to body transformation. Pratt famously shed 60 pounds in six months for his role in Jurassic World and continued to work hard and eat super healthy for Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, I don't watch TV and I don't watch movies, so I don't know anything about these movies. Maybe you have. But Rudd said this. He said, eliminate anything fun for a year and then you can play a hero. In addition to his insane no-carb diet, Rudd told People magazine that he had ditched alcohol for an entire year and basically revolved his entire life around eating and exercising. My day was centered around fitness and health, he said, and that was kind of a first, he explained to the magazine. Every other time I had to go about my day and try to find the time to work out. But this time, everything else was about my day kind of had to fit in around the workouts. Mm. Then he made this statement, which is convicting to me. He says, I was going to be held accountable for it. And there was a reason for doing it. Mm. I wasn't just randomly doing this kind of arbitrarily which would have made it a lot harder. Mm. So he said he was going to be held accountable and he had a reason for doing it. Now his reason was money and fame. Keep that in mind as we move on through this. If an unsaved man could put forth this kind of diligence to star in a movie. What is the blockage that is stopping us from being a good soldier for Jesus Christ? According to verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Our problem is we are tangled up. Y'all know that I do tree work. And some of the hardest jobs that we do are jobs that are these trees that are engulfed with, with vines. Yeah. It's one thing to to climb a tree. It's, it's difficult. Well, then you put vines all around it. Yeah. That's even more difficult. Right. Especially when one or two or all of those vines are poison ivy. Mm. Or you're trying to cut a tree down and it's a small tree, maybe, and it's overtaken in vines and you cut a limb and the limb doesn't fall. Yeah. And it doesn't fall because the vines are holding it up there still. Right. When you do get it on the ground and you start working around it and in it and trying to cut it up, then you get tripped over it. You fall down. And then you're trying to drag it over here and you thought you cut all those vines and you did except for one and so you're dragging it and now you're trying to drag the whole pile and you can't so you have to turn around and go back and cut that one vine. It's just aggravating. You get tangled up in them. The tree is tangled up in them. These vines... They slow us down. The same is true in our walk with Jesus. Right. <clears throat> Satan lays all kinds of things in front of us to slow us down. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Very common verse. You probably, some of you probably know it by heart. 
Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice that he says, let us lay aside every weight, comma, yeah. and the sin which doth so easily beset us. There is obviously a difference between the weight and the sin. Yeah. Or he wouldn't differentiate the two. Right. The weight very likely isn't sin. In other words, these things that got you or me tangled up may not be sin in and of themselves. But they become sin because they've slowed us down or stopped us from doing God's will. So I've got two questions for you. What is God's will for you? By the way, it's different for each one of us in many ways, but the same for all of us in some ways. All of us are commanded to shine for Jesus every day. All of us are commanded to share Jesus with somebody when He gives us that opportunity. All of us are commanded to show love to those people who are in our pathway. All of us are commanded to do these things. And then some of us are commanded to speak to a specific person. That person who God has commanded me to speak to, He hadn't commanded you to speak to them. That person who has done me wrong, and God has commanded me to forgive them and move on past that, He hadn't called you to forgive that person. Just me. You, you see what I'm saying? There are things that God has has called you to do that are different than everybody else. God has given each one of us talents and gifts mm -hmm. to be used for His purpose. <clears throat> are you using it for His purpose? Mm -hmm. Only you can use that gift. It's no one else's responsibility but yours. Right. What is it? What is that gift that God has given you? I would suggest you do some research if you don't know what it is. I'm talking about research in the Bible. Find the areas in the Bible where God is talking about these gifts. There's even, uh, and you can find them on, on, online even, yeah. a spiritual gift test. Yeah. I've taken that test before. Um, it, 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 it's a biblical thing. You, you go through the different um, gifts that, that God has given and, it, and then it get, offers questions on things that you like, things that interest you, things that make you feel fulfilled. And after you go through this questionnaire, it, it kind of narrows it down and shows you that, well, here is your gift. It's a good thing to do. Find out what God's gift to you is. Okay? Then ask yourself the question, am I fulfilling God's plan in my life using the gift or gifts that God has given me? And if not, what is it that's got me tangled up? Stopping me from doing God's plan. If it's God's plan for all of us to share Jesus with somebody, and it is, yeah. when was the last time you did that? What's stopping you? What's got you tangled up? No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. 
Brother Tommy, I'd love to help you all up there on that work day, but I've got some other things I've got to take care of. What? I'm sure those things are important. But are they more important than doing what God called you to do? Not that it's God's plan for you to come up here and work because it's not everybody's that's not God's plan for everybody, and I get that. I know that. I'm just saying there are things that you could be doing. Yeah. There are people in our church that would love to see your face at their front door. Yeah. And we don't make time for that. Mm. We don't even make time to get on the phone and call them. Mm. Say, hey, I missed you. Haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? I'm praying for you. Is there anything I could do to help you? What is stopping us? What's got us tangled up? I think many times it's our selfishness, our comfort zone. We don't like to move out of our comfort zone. We have a we have a, a routine, we have a plan, we have a, a regular thing that we do every day when we get off from work. We don't want to break out of that. We have a regular thing that we do on a Saturday. We don't want to break out of that. When we were going to harvest, the pastor had asked this particular man, he said, hey, can you can you come up and go soul winning on, with me on a Saturday? He says, uh, no, can't do that. That's the day that me and my wife go uh, yard sailing. What's well, good for him and her to go yard sailing? Yeah. I mean, they're being frugal with their money. They're spending time together. God likes that. Yeah. But he couldn't make time to go soul winning. Mm. Remember, we are to lay aside every weight and sin. Yeah. Those things are different. It's a good thing to go yard sailing. It's a good thing to spend time with our wife for us men. That's a good thing. Yeah. But if it's going to stop us from soul winning, it becomes a bad thing. Mm. And it becomes one of these things that he's saying, lay it aside because it's stopping you from doing what God's told you to do. <clears throat> a person who runs track. By the way, when he said here in Hebrews, he said, lay aside every weight. Why? So you can run the race. Yeah, yeah. A person who's running track does not run track with water boots on, heavy jeans, and a big overcoat. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. No, they're going to... You could probably weigh their shoes and their clothes in ounces instead of pounds. Mm. Sir? Unless he's trying to lose weight. <laughs> right. Right. I was advised back when I was running track to wear my work boots and to r practice running in sand. <clears throat> and I decided to go a step further and I put on my water boot or, or water boots, my work boots, and I put a hundred pound sack of feed on my shoulders and then ran through the sand. That's idiotic, isn't it? But I did one first place in the state of Florida on the mile run in the ACE convention. So it helped. Amen. But if I'm on the race, I'm not going to do that. No. No, I'm going to weigh my clothes and my shoes in ounces. Why? Because I want to win. That Paul talked a lot about this racing thing. He used athletics to show us some things. Yeah. And he made it clear that if we're going to be running a race, that you want to lay aside every weight. Why? Because we want to win. Mm. Not come in second, third, or worse, not even place. Mm. So the Christian who's running the ultimate race should also lay aside 
anything that is dragging them down from doing God's will. So I'm going to go back to those same two questions. What is God's will for you? Remember, it's different for all of us in some ways. And then it's the same for all of us in other ways. What is God's will for you? And then the second question is, what is stopping you or slowing you down from doing it? This is important because we are in a race. Amen. We are in a battle. And both of them, you don't want to lose at. Mm-hmm. So let's find the answer to these questions and that will be our homework for this week. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for loving us. And You showed Your love to us by sending Jesus to die on the cross and to pay for our sins. And the reason was because we couldn't pay for our sins. We needed a Savior. And thank You so much for that. Thank You for Your Word. And Lord, I thank You for calling us to do a job for You. And I pray that You'd help us to recognize what that calling is. Yes. Just as importantly, help us to recognize what is stopping us from doing it. Mm. And to get rid of that. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.